we have some wonderful panelists today who are going to be talking about graduate school opportunities in data science. Our panelists include Joel Hogan, who's a professor and chair in the Department of Biostatistics at Brown University. He received his doctorate in biostatistics in, from Harvard, and his research focuses on statistical methods for large-scale observational data with an emphasis on applications in HIV and infectious diseases. For the past 15 years or so, he's collaborated with colleagues at Moya University in Kenya on research training and capacity building. And so we're thankful for him to be here and to share the exciting innovations that they're doing at Brown University for graduate school opportunities. Our second panelist is Imani Maliti. She's a master's in data science student at Columbia University. She recently graduated from Clark Atlanta University with a bachelor's degree in mathematics. Her objective as a data science for the people is to use research to create a narrative of data that is fully reflective of and accessible to all communities affected by its usage. She especially has a passion for data-driven projects that revolves around reproductive justice, educational justice, and youth engagement. While at CAU, she was super busy. She was an LSAMP scholar who analyzed spatial disparities affecting Mississippians, access to reproductive health care. She was also a, a researcher in the summer program, also known as SPIRAL, where she conducted student-led um, spatial statistical research on social determinants affected COVID-19 case and death rates in New York City during the pandemic. And she also participated in our UCLA where she developed code tailored to hard to bias word to vec models using socially sensitive data. So we welcome her back to the AUC and we're super proud of the work that she is doing. Our third panelist, panelist is Gialusha Iacarno. He is a professor of mechanical engineering and director of the Institute for Computational Mathematical Engineering, also known as ICNI at Stanford University. He received his PhD in Italy in 2005 and has worked for several years at the Center for Turbulence Research. Uh, that's between NASA Ames and Stanford before joining the faculty at Stanford. So he's also been a director of the PSAAP Center for Center at Stanford, funded by the US Department of Energy, a $20 million research center focused on multi-physics simulations. He's also received the Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering from President Obama for his work on uncertainty, quantification, and computational science. So he comes with a, a myriad of accolades and enjoys using computing and data to solve problems in energy, biomedicine, and aerodynamics. We're also super thankful to ICME for opening up the fundamentals of data science from our workshops to AUC faculty and staff. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and the first panelist up will be Joe. Welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Washington. And I just wanna um, express my gratitude for the opportunity to come here and, and uh, share some things about biophysics and data science and hope I can contribute to all the remarkable activities uh, being conducted by AUC. Um, it's really, it's it's fantastic to, to uh, have a chance to engage with, with all the participants. So I'll share my screen. Um, all right. Uh, will this work or should I change to a different format? Um, you can hit the presentation button at the bottom right. So you can okay. full screen. I'm not a PowerPoint expert, but I, there we go. Let's see. The, the little bit, the, the icon left to the minus sign. Oh, right there. There you go. How's that? Does that work? Perfecto. All yes. right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just a title slide. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Biostatistics here at Brown. Uh, I also chair the department and uh, I leave my email here. So after this or at any time, you can feel free to use it and, and reach out. So as we were preparing, uh, Dr. Washington gave us a bit of a brief about topics that the participants might be interested in. And I think we'll probably cover a lot of these in the discussions and in the Q&A. But one of the first questions um, <clears throat> when I talk to data scientists and data science prospective students, one question I get asked a lot is what is biostatistics? Is it actually data science? And biostatistics is uh, the branch of statistics 
that is concerned with addressing questions in uh, biomedical research, public health, and health more broadly. So biostatistics is genuinely a data science, and it really has the three pillars of data science that uh, sort of get associated with definitions of data science. That is, the work we do is almost always motivated by a substantive problem in health. So for example, does this new drug for HIV lead to longer survival? Can we make accurate predictions of diagnosis from combining imaging data with electronic health data? Did this policy of masking in schools prevent cases? How many hospitalizations of, from COVID will we have uh, next month? So these are, these are like real world public health and biomedically driven questions that we develop new methods for. Some of the tools we use in biostatistics include things you may have heard of in your undergraduate study. Uh, we use all kinds of regression models. We use machine learning, uh, Bayesian inference. We use high-end computing, um, artificial intelligence, and all kinds of methods that uh, you might also hear about in, in other areas of data science. So it's a really exciting field to be in because we, um, you know, we have a public health orientation, and you know, one of the first vignettes I saw in the intro, uh, the the um, the student who was talking about interest in data was saying, "Well, you know, we have lots of data, and we have problems that matter, and this is exactly what we concern ourselves with in biostatistics." The kinds of study uh, students that study biostatistics include those who are undergraduate math majors, computer science majors, sometimes biology majors. We look for students that have um, the kind of background that you need to engage uh, sort of the mathematical and computing side of statistics. We don't expect that students have had a statistics class in, in the past, if you can believe that, um, but we look for students who are prepared to do coding at an advanced level using packages like R. I saw like Dr. Idris is uh, uh, organizing training in, in R programming. Um, we expect say two to three semesters of calculus some linear algebra so that there's a level of fluency in mathematics. So if you're thinking about graduate study in biostatistics, boning up on your skills in, in uh, computing and in math are gonna be the most important things you can do. A lot of students ask me, do I need to know biology uh, to do biostatistics? The answer is no. Um, so biostatistics, really the bio part just means that we're concerned with problems uh, involving human health more, most broadly. Some of our Researchers do work on problems in like genetics and genomics, but it's not necessary that you're a biology major or even have had a biology class in order to take a program in biostatistics. Another question that I get when students reach out to me about our program is <clears throat> what sort of financial support uh, is available for biostatistics students? And in our PhD program, I should say that anyone admitted to our PhD program is fully supported by tuition and a stipend. Um, so the cost, there's no cost to the, to the student. Uh, and our master's program is a two-year program, and we do have opportunities to serve as TA and research assistant. Um, but I do have to say that for the vast majority of the master's students, there's some component of having to, um, to pay some of the cost. So it's not fully supported. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one exception in a second. Um, as far as career opportunities, you know, a lot of folks think well, if I get a PhD, uh, then I just need to go, I'm just preparing to be a professor. But in fact, a lot of our students who graduate the PhD program wind up in places like Google, Amazon, um, and so forth, where high-end data science tools are being used. Many do go on to academic careers. And our master's graduates, really, it's been amazing to me the variety of positions that our master's graduates have wound up in. Everything from like the finance industry to healthcare, uh, to start up biotech companies. So really the skills that our students get um, are, are quite portable. So I did wanna just put in a quick plug for, um, for graduate study at Brown. Really not a plug because I think, you know, a lot of students are gonna have choices and in, in making a decision about where to go, I think depends a lot on what, you know, what you find important in a school. At the School of Public Health, um, we have a rich academic environment. We're one of four departments of biostatistics. Uh, and you know, one way we think about comparing ourselves to others is that we, um, you know, we rank really highly in NIH funding. And uh, we're a relatively new school. Um, we just were commissioned in 2011. 
but we've quickly risen um, to the ranks of one of the top schools in the country. I did notice um, there's one question that says, do, do most PhD students first get a master's degree? I'll just take a quick digression and address that. The, the short answer is uh, most, I think, would have master's training before going on to a PhD. Um, but we do have plenty of students who have gone right from a bachelor's degree. Um, here's our just a quick overview of our master's uh, program. Just as far as alumni, you can see on the left, you know, where some of our master's graduates have gone. Sports analytics has become really popular and surprisingly, biostat grads have wound up uh, places like the Baltimore Ravens. One of our grads is the head data uh, head of data analytics for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, so we have a lot of those sorts of placements. So I wanted to just also mention the, um, and then I'll stop, uh, in a second, I wanted to mention the um, Next Gen Scholars Program in Biostatistics. This is something that we worked on for about a year to launch. We got a lot of great advice from Dr. Washington, uh, Dr. Muhammad Idris, whose name you heard before. Um, this program is designed for HBCU students and it sort of addresses Anna Rittenhouse's question. Um, it's often difficult to make the jump from bachelor's to PhD. And so, <clears throat> and it's also hard to get federal funding for master's training. So Brown has invested in the Next Gen Scholars Program. Um, it's designed for graduates of HBCUs. It provides full financial support, including a stipend for um, those who study for the master's degree to get a two-year degree. And we actually are just, uh, we have our inaugural class enrolling uh, this fall. And I'm putting up a, a photo of Lauren Crawford, whose name you might know. Lauren's on our faculty. He's also a graduate of Clark Atlanta. Um, and he splits his time now between Brown and Microsoft Research. And uh, he's um, he's really involved in the Next Gen program. He's really one of the intellectual leaders of what we're trying to do with that program. I'll mention lastly that Brown also has a one-year data science master's. I'll just put this slide up here. I think that if you look on the web for Brown Biostatistics, Brown Data Science Master's, you can get a lot of information you're looking for. The bottom line is we have three avenues to study data science, the PhD in biostatistics, the master's in biostatistics, a one-year master's in data science. And of particular interest to HBCU grads and students, the Next Gen program is something I really like to bring your attention to. And again, it's prominently displayed on our department website and I'll put it in the chat as well. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, just thank Dr. Washington again for the opportunity to talk about this. And I'd be happy to entertain questions once the other presenters or whatever, whenever the, question and answer period comes up. And I'll try to address questions in the chat if that's okay as they come up. Wonderful, thank you so much. Imani? Okie dokie, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, oh, I can't share while another part is finished. Oh, never mind. I spoke too quickly. Oh. All right, can everyone see my screen? I'm hoping. I Perfect. Can't wait. All right, great, wonderful, wonderful. Well, hello everyone. Um, I am Imani Olafunilayamuliti, uh, and I am just ecstatic to be here speaking with you all. Um, I mean, to be completely honest, when Dr. Washington originally uh, invited me to speak at the sem seminar, I was definitely a bit nervous. Um, I wasn't too sure if I was like, qualified to speak about graduate school opportunities, uh, especially since I just got started my own journey about a week ago. Uh, shout out to Bobby Schmurda. Um, but in like grappling with that feeling of imposter syndrome, um, I definitely realized that would be the perfect focus for this presentation. Um, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. And for those of you who like, it's, it's really in your brain and you just can't really get it out. If you are wondering, this is definitely named after a Kanye West quote, and I'm going to stick beside it. Uh, nevertheless, I wanted to start by giving you all a quick introduction to who I am and why this topic is so important for me. Um, I'm originally from the Bronx, which is you know the best borough in New York, uh, by way of Nigeria and Kenya, which are the best countries in the world. Um, and most recently, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, mathematics right here at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, right, I was heavily involved with research and community service and the African Students Association. Uh, it's also where I became a member of Del Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. 
And currently I am a master of science student uh, in data science uh, and the recipient of the JP Morgan Diversity Fellowship Award at Columbia University. Now that's a mouthful, uh, but with all of these like different titles and roles and experiences under my belt, um, I sometimes struggle to remember that in the words of Beyonce, I'm that girl, you know? And this is something that I often see among other students, especially us young black students. And let's be real, you know, for a lot of us, failure simply is not an option. Uh, but the pressure that comes with having that mindset can sometimes be crushing. So because of that, I'm constantly getting asked questions uh, about grad school and fellowships and other opportunities. Um, and I definitely welcome all of them. Please feel free to reach out to me even after this. Uh, but the one that I always get asked is, you know, how do I get enough experience to be a competitive applicant? Um, and for most of you on this call, I'm willing to bet that you are well on your way, if not already there. Um, but if you don't know already, let me be the first to tell you that no, you do not need the top internship in the industry. Uh, you don't need like the perfect major and you definitely don't need to know everything about everything. You know, if you have the ability to learn basic math and basic codes, and if you have the drive to learn how to blend those concepts together, you've already won half the battle. Uh, so what's the other half, you know? creating your own opportunities to learn. As a Black woman in STEM, if I simply waited around for people to give me opportunities to start honing my craft, I wouldn't exist as a Black woman in STEM. Um, and as students, there are so many resources that are available to you. So I'm gonna take this time to list out as much as I can, you know, in the time that I have. And the first of them is uh, your college experience. Please, please, please be intentional about your college experience. And note that I'm not just saying your college education. Uh, I would recommend that you know you uh, start with your classes, right? Because those are the easiest ways to fortify you know, your data science skill set. Um, you can take like a stats class or a programming class, linear algebra, data algorithms, you know, that would be great. However, for those of you who don't have the ability to fit all of those into your academic schedule, um, take an elective. I know Dr. Washington just mentioned that uh, the Data Science Institute offers a, a series of classes open to the AUC every semester. And if you only take one course, that's still one more thing that you can use to show grad schools that you are prepared for this next step. Now, let's say that taking classes just isn't a viable option. Um, you can still join clubs and organizations that bring those learning experiences to you on your own time, like the AUC Data Science Club or the CAU Mathematics Society. And also be on the lookout for events and workshops that different departments may be holding. Um, in fact, this is the perfect time to remind you, I know we reminded you once, second time is the charm, um, to sign up for the Virtual Student Data Science Symposium on September 23rd. Uh, you never know where you, where you might learn or um, network with someone or something new. Uh, so definitely take all those opportunities as you can. Now, the next thing that I would suggest is definitely to do some work, either in industry or academia. Now, I focused a lot on research throughout undergrad. Uh, however, if you are interested in a more industry-based approach, I would be more than happy to connect you with people who can talk more about that experience. Uh, but for those of you who are open to research, this is prime time. I cannot stress that enough. So definitely start looking into uh, research experiences for undergraduates or REUs. Uh, there, are, there are great ways to just get hands-on experience working with data um, in a team, right? And in a few weeks, these applications will start to open. So now is definitely the best time to look into which ones you are interested in applying to since there are so many of them. Um, and Google also has a very extensive list uh, that they post every year about like mathematical science REUs. So I'll make sure to send that link in the chat before we log off this call. Um, and if you don't want to wait until the summer to get started, uh, and rightfully so, uh, look into other opportunities to do research on campus. Um, LSAM is a great AUC program that I would recommend to anyone who is interested in STEM-based research. Um, and also, don't be afraid to ask around in departments for opportunities to work under professor or their research. You know, closed mouths don't get fed, and quite honestly, the easiest way to let someone know that you want to be on their radar is to simply just tell them. Um, so let's say that everything that I listed so far just isn't an option. Let's say you're taking 20 credits or you work two jobs um, or you're even two years removed from college. Don't forget that there's still power in taking initiative, right? And there are so many self-paced courses for 
everything nowadays. I mean, I can't tell you how many YouTube series that I've watched to further my understanding on various topics. Now, luckily for us, YouTube and relatively like the, the rest of the internet is free. Um, so definitely use that to your advantage, right? And if you want to take it a bit further, uh, get an official certification. You know, there are great ways to not only build your skill set, but also great ways to ensure that institutions and corporations that you are applying to recognize that you have gained these skills, you know, outside of traditional classes. Now, heads up for people who don't know, they do cost a pretty penny. I won't lie to you. I'm here to be honest. Um, but there are some that offer funding options and other organizations on campus that provide opportunities to get them funded as well. Now, as you are building your skill set, um, also remember to do some, you know, self-directed projects. Uh, Kaggle has tons of data sets to download and projects to recreate and GitHub does as well. Uh, not to mention that in this day and age, data scientists are also influencers. So you can easily find inspiration on TikTok or engage in discourse on Twitter. Um, you are using the apps anyways, might as well add some duality, you know, to your For You page. That's never hurt anybody. Um, but I know that was a lot of information. Um, I'm trying not to go too fast. So, I mean, we can all take a deep breath, you know. Um, these are a lot of things to consider as you plan, you know, your next step for your academic career. However, I am also a firm believer that in order for you to produce your best work, you need to constantly prioritize and uplift your best self. Um, so there are a couple of things that I've learned throughout my journey, some of them the harder way, that I would like to share with you as you start to begin yours. Uh, first and foremost, stop waiting to be perfect to start trying. The only way to retain information is to do something worth retaining. So just go ahead and give it a try. And even if you don't know exactly what you're doing when you start, you'll definitely learn into it as you go. Secondly, commit to being a lifelong student. Now, don't go here, you know, leave the call and start telling everybody that Imani told you to be a super, super, super senior, because that is not what I'm saying. Um, but definitely recognize that your days of learning should never end at the like at your, you know, the end of your undergrad matriculation or even at the end of grad school, you know, because data science is constantly evolving. I definitely implore you to continue to seek new knowledge, not just in the classroom, you know, but on your own time in your own creative ways. Uh, next. I would say, you know, lean on your community. You know, I am who I am because we are. And I'm actually really excited because I see that some of my mentors, uh, Dr. Rucker and Dr. Jackson, and of course, Dr. Washington are on the call. And if not for them, I truly do not know if I would be standing in this position talking to you the way that I am. Um, but yeah, there are people who genuinely want to see you succeed, you know, and beyond your wildest dreams. So asking for help can be scary at moments but don't let your pride get in the way of your progress. Uh, and lastly, uh, I think the most important thing is to find what brings you joy and stick with it. Um, industries and institutions will continue to take and take and take as much as you give and give and give, and they will leave you with nothing if you let them. You know, Find your why, find your passions and lead with them. Uh, figuring this out will of course make it easier to write your personal statements for grad school, but uh, more importantly, they'll serve as a daily reminder of why you do what you do in the first place. And as Black people in this industry, um, you'll definitely need those reminders to ground you when things get really tough. So please hold on tight to your joy um, so that no matter, you know, what every other person in the world is doing or what type of energy they're on, you can always remember that you've got it. You know, that is your superpower and that they can never take away from you. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, with that, I would love to give a huge thank you to Dr. Washington and the AUC Data Science Initiative uh, for giving me the platform to speak with you all. Um, and if you all have any other questions, I know we'll have the Q&A later on, uh, but I'll try to answer as many things as I can. So uh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, Gian Lucha? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me see if I can share my in here okay i think you should see my my slides now up Perfect. so uh first of all i want to uh, thank you um dr washington for inviting me here um i want to also thank the speakers before me because they they did a great job in sort of introducing uh many of the topics that i was uh, planning to discuss anyway i think we are we're all on the same page for for many of the of the comments so I'm here to tell you a little bit about ICME, the Institute for Computational Mathematical Engineering, and, and the programs that are related to data science. 
But I want to I want you to take these notes and and the the words that I'm 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 gonna uh, tell you as a uh, as a template for more or less experiences and how these programs are organized uh, across university across different university. Obviously, there will be differences, but the the basic ideas I believe are very very similar. So let me let me get started. Tell you what um, ICME mission is. Um, we are uh, uh, established at the intersection of uh, uh, computational mathematics and statistics, data and computing. And the goal is very much like uh, um, uh, Joe mentioned at the beginning to solve, understand and solve problems that are um, uh, very important, both from a technology perspective, but potentially for a, for a social perspective, for a, for a societal perspective. Um, the, this sort of interconnection between math and statistics on one end and computer science and algorithm on the other, I, I believe is sort of the, the, the uh, seed of all data science programs um, around the world. Uh, specifically, what we have in ICME is a program that now is, uh, um, has been around for about 20 years. So this started very, very early at, at Stanford as an interdisciplinary program. It's very small, it's about 200 uh, total uh, students in, enrolled in the program. Uh, so this is total across the entire program. Um, and uh, uh, as a, a large number of faculty that are involved in the program is 61 right now. Um, what is amazing and interesting about uh, the ICME uh, infrastructure, but as I said, this is shared with many uh, data science uh, uh, institution around the country, is that it tends to be extremely, extremely diverse. Uh, specifically, ICME is part of the School of Engineering at Stanford, but we do have faculty that are, that are um, affiliated with all the schools on campus. So as you can see in this, uh, in this diagram in the back, in the bottom here, we do have a large uh, fraction of faculty coming from earth sciences, from the medical school, from the business school, and so on. This obviously creates enormous opportunity for our students to, to engage with different topics and different research, research areas. Now, um, you have seen, you have heard a lot about the student perspective in terms of uh, applying to graduate school. Um, in a sense, I, I think what I want to convey is something very similar to what Imani was saying before. Uh, what we are looking at in the application pool is, is really excellence in, in a number of dimensions, right? It's not just academic excellence in the sort of standard uh, sense, you know, grades and, and uh, um, you know, transcript. But it is research experience, it is evidence of leadership, and, and more important is passion, right? What we want to see in the students that apply is that they are doing it because they feel that there is a, that they have a drive to sort of move further in, uh, in learning, uh, you know, data science in this, in this context, but more importantly, learning and then apply their learning to, to have an impact in, in the world. And I think that's, obviously, it's not easy to encapsulate this in an application, but I'm, I'm here just to, to um, stress once again that uh, uh, grades and, and specific classes that you have taken are important, obviously, but they're not the distinguish, the only distinguishing factor. And just to give you an idea, um, in, in the ICME program, we do have students that have very, very different uh, majors that come and, and are admitted to the program. So, you know, computer science, math, statistics, some engineering majors, sometimes uh, a business majors, so that the Again, the, the type of path that leads you to ICME can be extremely, extremely diverse. And that's actually an added value to what we are trying to build in our community. Um, the other thing that makes our program uh, exciting, and, and as I said, is common to most of the program, is extremely tight connection with the external uh, uh, partners. So both other, other um, educational institutions, but also industry, corporations, startups, and so on. Because as, as was mentioned before, data science is is continuing, evolve, is continuing to evolve and actually uh, uh, provides a tremendous amount of opportunity in terms of, of careers. Now, um, specifically for the master's track, um, so the, the data science master in, in ICME at Stanford, this is actually the only program that is formally a data science uh, uh, master's at Stanford. Obviously, data science is part of the uh, statistics and the ICME uh, we, we sort of share that program in the, in the uh, university. Uh, it's a course-based program. Uh, there is no thesis requirement. It's uh, typically two years, but can be formally completed all the requirements in five quarters. So it gives you a tremendous amount of time to then expand more um, in terms of your uh, learning goals, but also 
uh, apply uh, for internships, engage in research, additional activities, and so on. So it's a it's a, um, a program that provides uh, um, quite a bit of flexibility. The curriculum is really tailored to specific interests that the students might have. Uh, that that two dimensional diagram I have on the right there sort of explains or at least conveys the, the idea that you might want to take a, a, a master's, go into a master's to uh, spend more time on the theoretical side, perhaps, rather than applied side or vice versa. If you have more theoretical experience, you want to focus more on applied. And similar in terms of uh, disciplines, you might be wanting to focus more on the statistics side to understand the, the, what is behind the scenes on the, on the theoretical level, or perhaps the computer science to focus more on the coding and the computational aspects. So this is really left to you as long as you have sort of a, um, a, a, a focus that is, that is well-defined. Otherwise, in general, we do have a, a program components that provide sort of guidance in terms of what the, the general uh, setting would be. Um, I, I also, again, want to mention that uh, uh, working, doing research, independent studies, both what, with faculty and external partners is extremely useful, and extremely important. And we do have a, a large community of uh, industrial affiliates that provide mentorship, opportunity, career opportunities, and so on, always available. Um, we do have funding available, both via uh, scholarships for, for the masters, but also uh, with teaching assistantship and, and so on. But uh, typically the program is a, a program that uh, uh, is, a, is a jump start for a career in, in, in data science. And, and there are a lot of details in, uh, in the uh, bulletin in the, in the link below. Now, the PhD is, uh, is different uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, these are parallel paths. So you can enroll in a master program or in the PhD. Uh, transfer from one to another they tend to be uh, quite difficult in the sense that the scope and the, and the organization of the program are quite different. Um, it turns out in, in, uh, in the PhD program, the first year is really focused on coursework to strengthen the foundations. Uh, that you have in, in uh, specific six core areas that are listed there. I'm not going to go through details. But the, the basic idea is that what we want you to be after your first year is a, is a, um, uh, a sort of a, a, uh, a, super, um, a super computational scientist, ready to pick uh, any problem, approach it from a variety of different angles. Uh, and the idea is that right after that, you basically engage completely and fully in research. So there are very, very few requirements after the first year. Um, you can pick research on an incredibly va variable variety of, uh, of different topics. This is just a um, sort of a sample of some of the uh, research that our current students are doing, uh, some of our PhD students are doing, um, and, and funded is guaranteed at that point. So uh, funding from a PhD perspective is guaranteed actually from the first day that you arrive on campus, you're admitted to the program all the way to the completion. Um, and uh, the other thing that is interesting is it typically takes four years, but uh, it's not um, um, really strictly connected to, to any particular um, uh, timeline. You, you basically up to you, up, your, uh, up to your advisor to sort of decide sort of when, uh, when this is, uh, um, when, is, when you're ready, when you are uh, ready to move to the next step. So it's a great opportunity to really dig into, into important problems apply different skill set to, to solve them, and, and being innovative, being creative to, to um, uh, approach, approach these kind of problems. Um, one, one thing that, again, was mentioned before, uh, we are very proud um, in, uh, in ICME, but in general, in these programs that involve data, to see that our students have a lot of doors that open up when they finish their program. This is actually particular for PhD students. Um, but I, I, I just like the idea that there is typically a very even split between student going to academia versus student going to, to industry. Now, for the master's students, obviously, the, this pie chart is a little skewed towards, uh, um, towards uh, uh, industry and also towards uh, students that decide after to, afterwards to continue perhaps in, uh, um, in a PhD after their master's. Although, as I said, this is not really necessarily a requirement. But as you can see from, from just a, a, a list of five examples here, there is a very large variety of sort of opportunities that open up for, for our students afterwards. And uh, let me just uh, finish by saying that uh, one el element that is very important in graduate school, I believe, is, uh, you know, is very much important in, in undergraduates as well. But in graduate school, is, is even more important because it's sort of the, 
the starting point of your sort of career afterwards, sort of finishing um, uh, a degree in uh, a master's or PhD degree. So we do have uh, a number of events uh, on campus. Uh, Dr. Washington mentioned the, the foundation of data science workshops in the summer, but we do have a career forum uh, this is really uh, a research symposium uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in ICME, um, and a number of student-driven activities. So you can continue to sort of show your leadership and your interests and you know, collect um, um, uh, enthusiastic peers that will work with you to you know, fulfill certain, certain goals that you might have. And these are all things that we try to do and try to um, uh, expand on uh, every opportunity we have. So um, I'll stop here. I want to thank you uh, for the attention. I want to thank again uh, Dr. Washington for inviting me. And uh, I'm happy to uh, continue with, uh, with the conversation and answer questions as, as might be uh, needed. I'll, I'll look at the chat, uh, see what's happening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we've been putting some links in the chat. And to all registrants, we'll send the slides. And if you want to copy and you're watching this on YouTube later, um, send us an email and we can send you a copy of the slides. Uh, for right now, I want to bring up Dr. Justin Ballinger. So we have a poll. And Dr. Justin Ballinger, he's the Deputy Director of the AC Data Science Initiative, and he is going to give us the poll results. Dr. Ballinger? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. And again, thank you for joining us this uh, morning uh, for our Lunch and Learn and our seminar on graduate school. And what we're gonna do now is just kind of review the results of the poll. So um, these are questions that you just answered about preparing for graduate studies in data science. So question number one, what is your status? It looks like most people are currently enrolled students about 71% and we have about 29% who are working professionals. Um, next we had question number two, if you are a student, what is your level? It looks like we mostly have seniors so um, the majority uh the largest pool that we have here is 33 percent seniors we have two percent freshmen 10 percent sophomores 10 percent juniors and then 16 percent who are master's students and uh three percent who are phd students and 26 percent who are currently unenrolled all right question number three how do you identify it looks like the ladies have this one so we have 59 percent female 41 percent male and um, zero percent uh, as trans transgender and zero percent in other. And then four percent uh, of question number four, where do you currently live? About 21 percent of our participants are from Georgia, 74 percent not from Georgia, but in the United States and five percent international. Uh oh, Dr. Ballinger, it seems like your um, connection is going in and out. I'm not hearing you, and I think you've frozen. So I'm going to pick up where he left off, that we have a number of attendees that are not in Georgia. So if you could put in the chat where you're from, uh, that would be super. Uh, question number five is, what would you most like to know about applying to graduate school? 29% or 17 respondents said how to find funding, the dollars. And then also, which schools to apply to? 34% said that. And then also 17% said, well, what graduate admissions test um, do I need to take? What are the requirements? Is it the GRE? Is it the GMAT? Is it the LSAT? And it's changing all the time at different schools. And then 3% was, where do I want to live? And then 16% is, does the program fit my lifestyle? Number six, which of the following is not a graduate degree? Okay, so this is the tricky question. So 14% uh, said that DDS was not a graduate degree. Hmm, that's doctor of dental surgery. So that is a graduate degree. 14% uh, chose sc.d, which is doctor of science. That is a graduate degree. And uh, overwhelmingly, 41% chose std, which is a doctor of sacred theology. That is a doctor degree. So std is a doctor degree, if you didn't know. Um, and then 17% chose DIT, which is a doctor of industry technology. So all of those are graduate degrees, except DDA. We just made that up. Data, something, I don't know. So DDA was the correct answer. That is not a graduate degree. Um, so thank you for participating in our poll. Uh, it was fun. 
And uh, so glad to have you all here. So right now we're going to flip to a question and answer with our panelists. So I'm just gonna ask the panelists to turn their cameras back on. And I am going to go through the questions on the Q&A. Thanks again, Dr. Ballinger, uh, for the, uh, the, the headings of the poll readout. All right, so I'm just gonna go through the Q&A. First, uh, there's a shout out from Dr. Monica Jackson, who's a Clark Atlanta alum and also professor in American who runs the SPIRA program that Monty participated in. She said, very proud of you, excellent advice, I agree. Um, and then somebody asked, can you, Imani, or anybody, um, chose, why, why did you choose to go to Columbia for your master's degree in data science compared to other schools? Did they provide funding? Did you apply? What about the living arrangements there? And then how did you find this? Like, how did you choose Columbia? No, that's actually a great question. Um, and Dr. Washington, of course, you know a lot about my story. You were there for the entire thing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I did apply to um, a couple of other uh, master's programs. Actually, I applied to ICME and I applied to Brown. Um, I also applied to Rice and, and a couple of other programs. Uh, and I've gotten to all of them, which I wasn't expecting at the time. I was just kind of casting my nets far and wide. Um, but ultimately, I chose Columbia. Um, Funding was a was a big a, a big thing. I will not lie to you. I, the fellowship definitely um, kind of like solidified my choice. Um, but all of the programs that I applied to were great programs. Um, so it really just came down to which one was once again going to fit my lifestyle. Uh, I also I'm a, I'm a city gal. You know, I love New York, <laughs> and not even to be like cheesy. You know, not in like a t-shirt kind of way, but I actually love New York. Um, and yeah, so when the option, you know, came for me to, to go back home without having to actually stay home, uh, I was like, yeah, you know, might as well see my family again for another couple of years before I decide to move somewhere else. Um, yeah, I guess that was kind of kind of the reason um, funding most definitely, you know, where I wanted to stay uh, and, and, and yeah. but also just be very selective about the the places that you do apply to to begin with. You know, you never know which one is going to provide you with the best options for you. Um, so if you make sure that you are intentional about where you apply to, you you don't really get too upset with the choices that you have left. Uh, so that I will say. Great advice. And Joe, I know you answered this in Q&A, but for our um, audio listeners, um, would a math major need experience in biology to study biostatistics in graduate school? Uh, the short answer is no. So, uh, you know, the bio, <clears throat> the bio refers to just the fact that biostatistics is sort of statistics applied to life and health sciences. Um, so it is, I don't know, I guess we're stuck with the name because I get this question dozens of times a year from prospective applicants. Uh, so I would say, you know, where statisticians who work in different uh, bio-related areas. So some of us, I don't actually, I don't, don't work at all in like, uh, bench science biology, you know, like lab experiments, genetics, genomics, that's not my field. There are those of us who do, but um, some people work on social determinants of health. I heard Imani mentioned that, uh, sort of more population level data. Uh, so it's really anything that deals with human health, broadly speaking. So a bio major or lots of bio classes are not necessary uh, to study biostatistics. That may be reassuring to some people. <laughs> I'll just say one quick thing. On the other hand, we have had bio majors who have a lot of math apply to our program, and that that's a nice combination. So if you are a bio major, you know, computational biology is a field of its own, and um, there's a lot of sort of mathematically and statistically oriented biologists. We have biomedical engineering here at Brown. So, uh, so if you are a bio major who wants to do some data-driven stuff, I would say dig into the math, dig into the stats classes. That will That'll make you a very appealing uh, graduate applicant. Great, thank you. Now I know um, for some reason the chat is disabled, but y'all can post stuff in the Q and A. So hit that Q and A button and, and write as you wish. Um, thank you so much. Um, so somebody asked, um, do most PhD students get a master's degree first? Um, Gian Lucia, what in your program? I know you have masters and PhD. Do you find that the people in your PhD program, do they ha first have a master's degree or do they get that along the way? So in, in, in general, uh, they don't. So the paths are really separate. Uh, it turns out that uh, for PhD students, because they spend a lot of time on campus, 
and they end up taking you know courses and and have experiences and so on in, in many ways they they pick up a master's as they as they go through some you know but it's not really a requirement and it's not it's not um, um it it happens but it's not um extremely extremely common i would say great great and Imani, somebody says, I'm a general mathematics major in undergraduate school and want to go to graduate school. How do you decide, you know, where do you start? There's so many graduate schools. And also, could you touch on how to get that letter of recommendation, which tend to be pretty crucial in that application portfolio? Yes. Okay. No, these are great questions. Um, so as Obviously, I, I was a general mathematics uh, major, you know, in undergrad. And um, what I love about math and data science, but let, let's focus on math for right now, <laughs> is that it can be applied to so many different things. Um, yeah, I when I first started as a math major, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew that if it included math, I would probably be good at it. So I was just very open to different opportunities um, and you know different uh, concepts and whatnot. So I will say I feel like this is definitely where experience comes into play um, because I you know did research in different fields and um, you know I, I I did a bit of the biostats, but I also did you know some natural language processing. I got to cast my nets far and wide. Um, I was able to figure out what I really liked. Um, and see which programs and which schools offered me opportunities to continue doing exactly that. Um, yeah, because once again, there are so many different schools and so many different uh, uh, programs, you know, that apply to math, you know, math goes everywhere. And even data science, it's a very broad term. Um, so figuring out what you like through experience, I feel like is definitely the best way uh, in terms of that recommendation. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's one that will set a lot of people back. Um, but kind of going back to my presentation, I feel like this is where community definitely comes into play. It's important to, yes, lean on your community, but you have to have a community built first in order for you to do that. Um, so be be as open as possible, right? Don't let your pride, once again, get in your way of your progress. You know, talk to professors, talk to everyone, you know, about not only what you're interested in, but really get to learn about these people that you're constantly seeing on your day to day. Um, you know, be below a surface level, get a little deeper, you know, have those those conversations um, so that when it is time to ask somebody for recommendation, it's not just a transactional conversation. I know I hate those, right? I hate having to ask someone like, hey, how are you doing? But also, um, while I have you on the phone right now, can you also do this one thing for me? You know, if you already have that, that conversation, uh, sorry, that relationship built, it's a lot easier and people are also more willing you know, to do those things, even if it's something that pops up last minute, they're more willing to, you know, help you out because they genuinely want to see you succeed. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, build those relationships, talk to everybody, everybody, you know? Yeah, relationships are so important. I just want to add one thing. I always tell students, make sure when you get a letter of recommendation, ask them if they can write a positive one for you. And if they say no, keep it moving <laughs> and thank them for their service. Yeah. Because you want to make sure that the best put is forward and give them all the information they need to, to write the letter. So great, great. I love that emphasis on relationships. And, and Joel, so somebody says we've heard a lot about technical requirements and you've done work in, in biostatistics with HIV, which is very people uh, based. Uh, so can you talk about soft skills, maybe working in a team or, or working with the, the end user or, or the participants? What sort of soft skills should prospective data scientists work on? What soft skills or professional skills are important? I would say, you know, something that uh, a lot of uh, science majors neglect is writing. So, you know, what does that mean? Like, so when I was an undergrad, I, I love what Imani said before, like, follow your why. I took a lot of classes I just thought were interesting. So I took courses in history and philosophy. And in those courses, you have to do a lot of writing. Um, you have to make arguments. You So a one soft skill is like, okay, you've done this great analysis. You've got all the output. Tell us what it means. And tell us what it means like in a hundred words or less. <laughs> so not tell us what it means by giving me reams of output. Uh, so this is something I find a lot of that instruction, even with our PhD students happens one-on-one. -on -one. I have to like spend lots and lots of time revising, revising, revising. So um, so writing, I think, is really high up there. Uh, no matter if you're going to be a member of a team, you want to be an academic, you're somehow, if you're a data scientist and you do the magic in the back room, 
then you're gonna have to bring it out and explain to people what it is and what it means. And uh, so I would I would emphasize that. And Dr. Washington, you mentioned working on a team. I mean, data science is becoming a team sport. Um, it's not really the sort of thing you just sit in your office and do quietly on your own. Uh, you're always, somebody poses a question, they ask you to help them answer it. So yeah, all the all the things that go along with being a good team member, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a whole, people have written books about that, but being a good team player, being a good team member, great, great soft skill. Great. And uh, so Jan Lucha, someone says, does the ICME graduate program have courses related to spatial statistics? And- uh... I was just gonna type that. So oh. uh, th there are a number of, uh, of uh, elements of spatial statistics in, in courses at Stanford. I, I don't think there is a, a class completely focused on that, meaning from a theoretical side, it's in a statistical side. Um, and, and the other thing maybe it's useful to mention is that I, in ICME, but just like in any other program, you're really not forced or not constrained to the ICME classes. So our students take classes in computer science where there is actually quite a bit of spatial statistics that goes on in, in application, uh, classes in stats, classes in uh, geophysics, for example. In geophysics, there's a lot of work in spatial statistics. So um, all these are, are open and actually, you know, very, uh, very well attended classes in, uh, at Stanford. Right, great. So someone says, uh, Imani, someone says, since math is such a broad major, how did you differentiate yourself for internships, research opportunities? Like how, how did you get them? How did you do it? Since these tend to be more focused and specialized. So, you know, what sort of background reading did you do? Questions did you ask? That sort of thing to, to differentiate yourself. Yeah, um, that's once again, a great question. Um, it's funny because as I mentioned before, when I started out as a math major, I actually had no idea what I wanted to do with that. I was like, yeah, I might just teach. You know, I'm pretty good at that. I'm, I'm a personable person. I'd be a good teacher. Um, but I knew that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do something outside of education as well. Um, so my first internship um, after my freshman year had nothing to do with data or math whatsoever. It was actually a social justice um, internship. And I spent the entire summer, you know, learning about that and, you know, really getting into that field and, and building my, my skill set um, or rather my, my knowledge, my domain knowledge um, in that field. And so when uh, my sophomore year came around, um, one of the things we had to do for uh, my degree was we had to take like a programming class. and it, Prior to that, every time someone was like, you want to be a computer science minor? No, nope. it's it's too many colors and too many letters on a screen. I don't like that. It hurts my eyes. Um, but I took one class and I was like, okay, I'll take the other one as well. You know, might as well continue what I'm doing. Um, and I, I got really, really into it. And when I started to see how um, math and computer science, you know, how it could mesh together so beautifully, I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and it was now later on that I, you know, when I started to create my own projects that I started to use that domain knowledge from two summers back um, to start to do, you know, my own findings and my own like analyses. And I think in doing that, I was able to market myself um, in a way that let people know that one, I knew what I was doing, you know, and that I was able to pick up things pretty quickly and that I had those background skills. Um, I think the best thing to do is definitely focus on what you can do. You know, don't focus on what you don't know. Don't focus on what you know you 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 haven't done yet. Um, you know, make sure that you really hone in on the things that you can bring to the table, right? Your enthusiasm. Um, you know, if you are a math major, it's not like you haven't done anything. You know, you have those 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 stats classes um, or, or whatever else you've taken so far, right? And those definitely add value. Um, and I think once again, this is also where taking initiative definitely comes into play. Um, you know, do your own research. I get like daily or not daily, actually, we had to cut it down a little bit because it does crowd my email, but I do get weekly emails from different um, like uh, uh, online uh, platforms, right? And they just keep me updated with what's happening in, in, in my field, you know, what are things that I'm interested in? And, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll read a little article um, and I'll, I'll, I'll find it interesting and I'll, and I'll follow up on that, you know, things like that definitely make a difference. Um, so, yeah, I would just, you know, play around with all the different sectors that you get introduced to. Um, find one that you like or find a bunch that you like, you know, and then see how you can bring those together. Or even if you're interested in things that people haven't really tapped into yet in the data science like uh, industry, be the first, you know, you don't have to wait for someone else to do it for you to start being good at it. So there's that. I love it. 
All right, so I think we're running out of time. So I'll ask one more question of Joe here. So as a 2020 grad with the BS in Health Science, will we guarantee a strong application for an MS or PhD in biostatistics given the gap years? Uh -oh. Given that they're graduate in, oh, BS in health science, I see it, yeah. Oh, 2020 grad. 2020 grad is not such a gap, uh, really. I mean, it seems like, you know, think about what the requirements are for the program you're interested in. And it's kind of, I just I just love what uh, what Amani said before, is like, follow your why. Like, what is it you want to do? So, I mean, I can speak if it's biostatistics and you have the right sort of prerequisites, then, you know, maybe take a refresher. There's so much online now. I mean, you can take, there's a terrific MIT linear algebra class. I refer a lot of students to that, especially because they'll say, oh, it's been five years since I took linear algebra. I'm like, okay, we'll just you know, walk through these lectures, do some of the homework. So if you've taken the classes, maybe just refresh yourself. If you haven't, then there are certain things that a program that you would be interested in is going to want to see on a transcript. So you have to be proactive about saying, okay, I don't have linear algebra on my transcript. Maybe the community college offers a summer class and I'll get that taken care of so I could show it in writing that I've done the work. So um, that's, yeah, it's, Fill in the gaps that are necessary is the, I guess would be the big advice. That's excellent advice. And so thank you, Joe, Imani, Gianluca. This has been a really informative panel. I know I've, I've learned some things and I think our participants did too. And um, thank you, Melvin Crumb for the shout out. He said he enjoyed your participate um, presentations. He's a Morehouse and Clark Atlanta alum working at the, the CDC just 32 years. And he we enjoy having him come hang out with us. And we also, invite everybody else to come hang out with us and uh, participate in our seminars in our upcoming program. So thanks again to the panelists. Really appreciate you all sharing your insights today. Hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a great day.